Good evening. Simon Jacobson here. I welcome you all for another episode of Wednesday Night Live. I welcome you, those here local as well as uh, online audiences. Thank you for making it happen. That thank you was uh, to God and also to some individuals. Because without the, te the technology that is, uh, people think is man-made is actually really tapping into uh, divine and uh, forces that are here from the beginning of time. The only thing is, we only recently have learned to tap into them. Which is uh, generally a good lesson in life as well. That uh, there are many, many forces at work that we may not be aware of. And just because we're not aware of it doesn't mean it's there. It's not there. You know, light waves, sound waves... Uh, cellular technology, microwaves, the things that we today take for granted and benefit from have been part of existence from the beginning of time. And yet people were not aware of it, and not only weren't aware, they also def obviously therefore didn't create any uh, uh, tools and methods to tap into these forces. So uh, one has to humbly wonder how many other forces are at work that we're still not aware of, especially uh, on a human level. Uh, we all have uh, what we experience, what we call the sensory world, that we experience with our five senses, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, touch, and smell. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist today to know that those are really superficial and uh, external outer, outer surface level experiences. So though we are consumed and we're seduced and we're completely... Um, uh, almost controlled by our senses, the fact is our senses only touch the surface, the tip of the iceberg of reality. When it comes to real matters of life, like uh, finding love, or dealing with pain, or existential questions, or the things that are intangible, they're compl they, the senses don't help us much. Uh, you, know, you don't see love, and you can't hear love, and you can't taste, touch, and smell it. No question is, of course, love can be expressed with the senses, but it's something that is supersensory. And the same thing is with our intelligence and with other human experiences. The things that matter most to us are actually supersensory, not sensory at all. But yet, and here's the great dichotomy and even dissonance, that we are, live in a world that is almost completely controlled by the senses. You walk down the street, you're, we're constantly hyper-stimulated, over-stimulated, by the different inundating messages that come our way, whether it's images, whether it's sounds, whether it's colors, the subliminal and sometimes not so subliminal forces that are constantly de demanding something of us. And yet there's another part of us that's another reality that is we'll call it the inner you, as opposed to the outer you, that is not necessarily nourished or, uh, or stimulated by these outer, uh, outer, extre uh, outer extremities. And that part of our lives is often undernourished because we're so stimulated on one level. I mean, this is where people bemoan, for example, people say that today children or adults sit five, six hours a day watching television. Television is maybe the ultimate example of hyperstimulation of your senses because it's visual. And the visual is a very compelling, as I said, seductive force. And in a way, people live their lives um, vicariously through with soap operas. And I know people who cannot miss a, an episode. This is their life. And it replaces, in a way, the drama of your own life. And the same can be with sports, and the same can be with other shows, or they could today call it reality shows. That makes it even more reality, because they call it a reality show, as opposed to the other shows as a so-called, you know, it's like reminds me of Coke and Diet Coke. They're both really, uh, as Walter Matthau said, authentic imitation leather, you know? They're both uh, imitation, but one is authentic imitation and one is not authentic. So that's how superficial life can be. I'm not one of those that believes in fire and brimstone trying to attack all technology and television. Obviously, they're gifts as well that can be used in ways to reach people and to reach uh, 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 and connect us in ways that was unprecedented, that is unprecedented in history. But at the same time, like every gift, if it's uh, not used properly, if it's not used with moderation, it can become like they say about any addiction, that, it, it, that uh, the, uh, the substance, uh, master, who's the master and who's the slave? If television or technology, you the master, and it's just your slave, so to speak, your tool, it's one thing, but if the tool becomes the master, and the, tool and the, and the, 
and the carpenter or the human being becomes a slave, then we've got a problem. So, as a small introduction, I think it's a good way to address the topic that I wanted to talk about this evening, which is about love. And as we titled it, Love, Verb or Noun. You know, um, and I think it's a good way to look at uh, one of the most, or maybe the most important need in a person's life. You know, just like any plant, any part of life for sustenance requires water, requires uh, uh, moisture for, sust for, for life. And this is not just the plant world, it's also um, the uh, human world. You know, we are 90% water. The globe is covered by uh, two-thirds of water. So the same is true love, which actually the Kabbalists compare to water, is an equally necessary component. And it's a good way to look at it. It's just like nothing can grow without watering it. A human being cannot survive without love. And uh, when we're deprived of love, especially at young age, it's going to have its consequences. There's no two ways around it. Just like a plant will wither uh, without love, we too will wither. And the way humans probably without love is even more disastrous than a plant. Because a plant will ultimately wither and die and that's it. We may stay alive but still be dead inside. So nurturing and everything that love brings to us is a critical component in life. And yet it remains such an elusive force. You can't just go, like, go to a store and just like you can buy bread or water or drinks or whatever it is that we need. You can't just go and buy love. As much as we would like to, to entertain the possibility, it just doesn't work that way. So it remains an elusive force where, in a way, like a double-edged sword, as I discussed last week and many times in this class. But to really understand and analyze what love is and how we deal with it, I think a good way to put it and ask the question, how you see love? Is it a verb? In other words, an action? A, an active uh, uh, state? Or is it a noun, which means a state of being? And this is not just semantics and academics. It actually has severe consequences how you see love. You see, we live in a world of acquisitions and commodities. We purchase things, we acquire things, we hoard, we, we uh, own things. And as such, we uh, also sometimes look at love the same way. Love is a, uh, something you acquire, which means it's a verb. It's a type of what we call a method. That's where you see an over, uh, an over emphasis on technique. People make love, you hear the expression, as techniques, sexual techniques, love techniques, physical ones, emotional ones, psychological ones. You know, some people call it manipulation. We all manipulate each other in some ways. And some people say that's all right as long as it's mutual manipulation, so to speak. Um, but it's all about really um, trying to acquire something. And therefore, it's, a state, it's not a state of being. It's not just a noun. It's an active, uh, an active force which one could argue, what's wrong with saying that? Well, the problem with that is that if it's an act of force in that sense, then you can say love is only there when there's the act. Um, do you love somebody when you're asleep, for example? And you think about it, if you really love somebody, you love them 24-7. You know, just take the simplest type of love, love of a child. Does a parent love a child only when you're hugging the child, only when you see your child? You love the child all the time. It's part of you. There are times where you express it like a verb, but love in that context is a noun. It's a state of being. It's part of who you are. Whereas if, if love was only something that is an action, meaning something that you have to stimulate, uh, then you can argue that it's only there when you're stimulated. And when it's not stimulated, it's not there, which ultimately turns love then into a very insecure type of state, of state because if it's not being stimulated, it's not really there. It's not unconditional. I'm going to elaborate more on this. I'm just saying this as like a so-called uh, overview. So I want to discuss this topic, and it's obviously connected to who we are as human beings and how we see ourselves. You know, many times you ask somebody about a personal identity, you ask them, who are you? Most people will give you their business card. But a business card is not who you are, it's what you do. It's your verb, it's not your noun. It's not your state of being who you are. As a matter of fact, to answer who am I, who are you, is not that simple. What are you? Are you with some of your parts? What about all the parts that you're not aware of? What about your unconscious? Some people say who you are is something that is impossible to answer because we're not even aware of all those invisible forces that I alluded to earlier that really shape who you are. We have no memories of our young, young childhood. We don't know so many things about our inner selves. 
we do know is what we're doing. Right now, I can tell you what I am doing, what this one's, what you know what job you are doing, you know what you want to do. In other words, you can identify things that are an action or actions, what you're actively involved in. But to identify who you are, the noun, the state of being, the person you are as a state of being, is far, far more complicated. So you could almost say, if you, I don't want to sound like a cliche, but you could almost say is that the noun of your life, as opposed to, <laughs> you move there to this and then, okay. No, 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 it's all right. You may have to just come right up front here. Yeah. No. You could almost say the noun of your life is really the, uh, the essence of who you are, and the verbs of your life is what the noun is actively involved in. In other words, in, as I referred to earlier, in a sense we have two parts to ourselves, our inner self and our outer self. The outer self is busy doing a lot of things. You have arms and you have legs and you have, as I said, eyes and ears and you're active in all kinds of different things. And each of us have our own set of series of activities which define our lives really. Our routines define our lives. Our habits become uh, our routines, our routines become our life uh, activities and then our life activities suddenly become our identity. But that's not really the way it was meant to be. I think it was Gandhi that said something like that. I don't remember the exact line, but it's a beautiful line where he says that be careful because your actions become your habits, and then your habits become your routines, and your routines become your patterns, and your parent patterns become your uh, life investments, and then your life investments become your identity. When in truth, if you think about it chronologically, the order is the other way around. When we're born, we don't have any habits. We have no routines, we have no patterns where a newborn child is exploring the world for the first time, completely uh, a clean slate, a completely clean slate. And then things begin to become imposed and shape that child. Parental attitudes, life experiences, disappointments, and we begin to adjust. And then we begin to become a product of our actions, of our activities. As we grow into adults, we grow older, what ends up happening is that our activities become so dominant of our lives that our identity has completely become obfuscated and it's been replaced by what you do instead of who you are. Now that wouldn't be a problem if what you do is a reflection of who you are. But the who you are had never really had time to develop. So it becomes, it becomes, uh, it disappears in a way, it becomes concealed and overwhelmed by what you do. And once you get out of school and you need to make a living, you need to make ends meet, then your job and your responsibilities and paying your bills and the struggle for survival takes over. And that becomes who you are. Not who you really are, but that becomes what you are doing. So your actions have become, as I said earlier, who defines what? Is it your identity that defines what you should be active in? Or is it your actions that suddenly becomes the way that defines your identity? And it comes to a point where you can't even distinguish between the two. And that's why when we look at ourselves right now in the mirror, each of us, you start saying, who am I? You say, well, if for the last 20 years I've been doing certain type of work, let's say it's uh, been successful, or it's not been successful, it doesn't really matter. But that has become what, what you have been so identified with, it becomes your identity. When in truth, your identity may not be anything involved with what you did. Not that you didn't invest any part of yourself in it, but it doesn't, it, in no way does it reflect who you are. So we have essentially a dichotomy then between our inner self, we'll call that the identity, your noun, and the outer self, which is the activities we're involved in, the actions, the responsibilities, the commitments, including our relationships. So it shouldn't be a surprise or a wonder to anyone why it's so difficult to find love. Because the first question is, what are you looking for? Are you looking for something that will really complement and nourish your identity, your true identity, or will nourish and, and complement the identity you have assumed, which may not be even the real you. So it's not about sometimes people saying, how can I find my soulmate? Maybe the first question should be asked is, how do you find your own soul? If you don't have your own soul, your own identity, you think it's going to be easy to find another identity that complements that? You can't even know what is right. Many people, you ask them what kind of spouse they would like to find, the dream spouse. So, I mean, there's some conventional answers. You, of course, have a nice person, good-looking, attractive, exciting, uh, you know, someone who has a, a secure job and can support. 
I mean, these are very generic answers, obviously, and, and there are nothing wrong with them per se, but a lot has to do with externals, not necessarily internals. And the reason for that is because if you don't know who you are, it's very hard to define what you really need. So we have a problem. We go to school and we grow up in a world that does not really train us to figure out what, who we really are. It teaches us a lot of good tools. The best education you'll get is a tool, as a, a top school will give you excellent tools. So you can go out there, you have enough tools, enough connections, enough know-how to find a good secure job, a career. But a school or education that teaches us who you are, it's almost like, almost like a uh, random luck thing. You grew up in the right type of family and your family had that type of confidence and security and I guess nurturing and unconditional acceptance. So many of us have that confidence to have a deeper sense of self. If you unfortunately don't grow up in an environment like that, it's too bad. What I would like to talk about is that this is, we're not victims. We could do something about all of this. And the reason, of course, I'm talking about it now is because we're in the month of Elul, which is a Hebrew month, the last month of the year that precedes the high holiday season. And this Hebrew month, as I mentioned, is really the month of love. It's a month that teaches us how to love, what is love. And I was been addressing each week another aspect of it. Last week I talked about um, the immature adult. That's been recorded. You could always look it up in the, online. And today we're talking about what is love, verb or noun. Another reason I'm addressing it is because it's also connected to this week's Torah portion, which is by no act, it's not an accident, it's also in the month of Elul. So the beginning of this portion talks about the famous mitzvah of Bikurim, the, the first fruit offering. You know, technically the story goes like this, that command comes to the Jewish people, that when you will enter, when you will enter the land that I have given you as a, uh, as a Yerusha, as an uh, inheritance, you shall take from the first fruit and bring it as an offering to me, to God. It's really the basis of why in the morning when we say Moda'ani, it's like every, every first is an acknowledgement that before you begin, before you make it yours, you acknowledge the blessings and the gifts that were given to you. It's really an act of humility, essentially, recognizing you're not a self-made person, recognizing that uh, the gifts we have come from a greater place. It's a, a certain humility in all of that. So that's this mitzvah right here. But the interesting contrast is this. The chapter is called Kisave, which means when you will enter, or you'll come into. And the re previous chapter is actually, it says Kiseitse, when you'll go out, when you will go out to war. So if you compare these two opening sentences of last week's and this week's, you have the, f the last week saying when you'll go out to war, and this one is when you will enter in to the land. Now, Utilizing the principle that I often talk about here, that these uh, verses and these ideas are much more than just the technical, mechanical part of Judaism, which so many of us who grew up with uh, yeshivas know the mechanical part, but there's a whole other part which is the soul part, the psychological and spiritual meaning in all of this. And these words are, are loaded with layers and layers of meaning. And what I always talk about here is not the mechanical, the technical part you can read on your own or can go to other classes, but to understand the Torah as a blueprint for life, a relevant blueprint that addresses the issues that, are, that, we, we, that we struggle with in our lives today, that's something you don't really hear much about. So that's what I try to emphasize. So when you talk about this contrast, it's interesting. To go to war is considered to be going out to war. To go into to the bringing of the first fruit or going into the land is considered an inner experience. So how, is, how do we understand that? Well, if you think about it, it's pretty obvious. The Torah is saying a very, very powerful point. You know, life is filled with battles. We all have our battles. We all have our struggles. Some of them are struggles with other people, you know, in a real way. People you don't get along with, people you have conflicts with, whether it's at work, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's in relationships. You know, the, the what they say, what is the, 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 the guy, the kid asks... Uh, Marriage counsel was the difference between engagement and a, uh, what are they called, engagement and, um, and marriage. He says engagement is what happens before the battle, you know. So some people say all relationships are a form of a battle. Um, and then we have, of course, the battles within ourselves, our psychological battles, the different conflicts between what our mind tells us, what our heart tells us, 
the conflicts, uh, psychological, uh, the wounds that haunt us, the voices, the ghosts, and so on. So in dealing with the conflicts of life, simply on a therapeutic, psychological level, the Torah is saying, always remember that you may have wars and battles to fight, but remember they're never be to be fought in, inside of you. Kisei say, go out to war. Realize these battles are outside of you. Why is that so relevant? Because it means don't let it contaminate your own psyche. As I said, we all have conflicts, but what happens worst of all is that it becomes a cancer and you personalize it. I've seen wars for people who are still fighting wars for years and years because it comes to a point of pride and ego that they've so personalized it that the war is no longer being fought in a battlefield. It's being fought 24-7 in your heart and soul. You're consumed with it. You ever see someone gets consumed with something? And what happens is, even if it's a legitimate battle, and even if you're right, another person is wrong, but you win the battle, you lose the war, because it's so, it's, it so drains and wears you down, it's eating you up alive. And I've seen this many times. Sometimes you have to stop yourself when you get in a place, especially if you, if, if you have true grievances, and you've been hurt or betrayed, and you have legitimate reason to really be angry. But the key thing the Torah is telling us, never let the battle contaminate the pure essence of who you are. And that goes back to what I said earlier. We have an outer life and we have an inner life. And we cannot allow the outer to take control of the inner. If you look at young children, newborn children, they have no fights with anyone. Because they're pure, they're not political, their egos are not yet developed, they don't have their turf, so to speak. Even when little children get into a fight and they say, I'll never talk to you again in my, the rest of my life, the 30 seconds they, they're the best friends again. You get to older people, you can go into certain nursing homes, two people who are best friends for 40, 50 years in their lives, they won't talk to each other even though they sit near each other. And we ask one of them, you know, how, how much longer do you have to live? You were one's best friend. He says, I can't say anything to him because if I say something to him, he'll think he was right. You know, little children don't think like that. We think like that. You know, we have to win. So it's not so much what is, you know, and, and sometimes it's, we justify that that's what's right. I'm fighting for the principle of being right. When in fact it really may be your own uh, personal thing. And even when you're right, you see the greatest people in history, even when they were right, they were able to move on. Joseph was very right to be angry at his brothers when they sold him into slavery and almost killed him. In 22 years he was separated. And yet when he met them and he, they reunited, he told them, despite their shame and their embarrassment, he said, you did not send me here, even though they sold him into slavery. It's God that led me here. It's one of the greatest acts of nobility. I can't say we can expect that from every human being, but the Torah tells it to us for a reason, because there is an element what's called maiver al of a person who's able to overlook their feelings. And many times when you overlook your feelings, God overlooks his feelings also, because we're all not perfect. How you treat others will be how you'll be treated. Because if you're harsh with everyone around you, then you basically opened up the, you've, you've already essentially passed the decree how you should be treated, also being harshly. So the, the approach of understanding that um, battles have to be fought outside of ourselves is a very, very powerful and far-reaching uh, attitude. Even if a battle has to be fought, remember Kiseitse, you go out to war. You don't bring it into your home. On a very practical level, you don't bring it to your dinner table. You don't bring it to your children. You don't let it extend into your family. I've seen wars where not only the person, one person is fighting, their children are involved, the wife is involved, the husband's involved, everybody. There. No one talks to each other. It carries on for generations. And even if it's a completely legitimate uh, uh, grievance, I don't know how healthy that is for anyone. Especially for the people who are allowing it to penetrate your life. Which is one of the big problems in general when you talk psychologically, you've been hurt by someone, let's say. Let's say by a parent. And you have legitimate, legitimate grievance, you have legitimate uh, uh, anger and legitimately uh, demand and require accountability. The question is, do you remain a victim of that person's crime? And very often, this doesn't mean you have to forgive a parent. But I mean, you have to forgive yourself, because as long as you're still carrying it, it means that that person is controlling your life, whether you like it or not. And that is even worse than the original crime. The real healthy growing is growing out of it to the point where, you know what? Even if that person has not asked for forgiveness, even if they have no remorse, you have to free yourself from their behavior. And that's a whole separate type of work. 
So that's the experience, that's dealing with the outer battles. We have to fight, uh, wars are outside of you. But then there's another part of ourselves. And that's the second chapter here that we read this week, Kisave, that you enter into. The word Save, which means to come or to enter in a, uh, in a more, let's call it more mystical or Hasidic type of terminology, it means to enter Bepnimius. It means to enter, truly enter into someone. Think of it in terms of a relationship, two people who really love each other or care about each other. There's an element of bonding and intimacy, and I don't just mean this physically, where they actually enter into each other's soul. They enter into each other's heart. And they allow themselves to enter. You know, with someone you don't trust, or someone you don't know, you're going to have a, a wall, uh, defense mechanisms, that will not let someone enter into you. You're not going to let them enter. You don't want them to manipulate you. You're fearful. Or at least as long as you don't know them, you're not going to open up. Someone that you love and you trust, you open up to. You allow them to enter into your life. So the battles should not be allowed to enter. But then there's something else that should be allowed to enter. And that's what this chapter talks about. So it's a very appropriate to this concept that I was discussing about the verb and the noun about love. Because love too, as I said, has two parts to it. There's how it's expressed, which is a, a series of verbs and methods and techniques and actions. But then there's the love of, uh, that's within you and that's your heart. That's a state of being. And this brings me into analyzing it a little further. Let's, let's discuss this uh, noun part of love. To, to um, argue that love is a, an action, only an action, and only a verb, would be, really be saying that you're one thing and the love you have is something outside of you. Important, but something outside of you. The example I used before, let's say when you plant, when you water plants, so the water is not part of the plant. The water is an outside force that nourishes the plants. No different than food we eat or the drink or, 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 or the liquid we drink. That is something outside of us that nourishes and sustains us. Now, if love is equal to that, then love is like an outside force that we need. So we go out to acquire it. So it initially seems to make sense. Judaism teaches us that's not the case. Love is who you are. You're actually an embodiment of love. Your soul is a loving entity. It's not only going out to get love and someone else. You are born as a loving human being, someone worthy of love and so, someone capable of loving, both giving and, and receiving. Let's define what that means, because love, in the, the Hebrew terminology for love is chesed. So if you're familiar with the spheres, and we've discussed this, uh, if you know the book I've done on the, on the Omer, the counting of the Omer, the seven times seven. So chesed is the first of the seven emotions. According to the Kabbalah, according to the mystics, the DNA, the building blocks of our emotional makeup, our emotional um, DNA, consists of seven emotions. With the first one being chesed called love. Uh, chesed called love is Yemen the Azalim Kuli Yemen. It means it is the root and the source of all other emotions. Just for the record, the other six emotions are discipline, compassion, endurance, uh, humility, bonding, and dignity. But the first and the driving force of all is chesed, love. There's a verse that says, Oilam Chesed Yibana, which has two interpretations. The world was built with chesed. It can mean built with chesed. Or, I mean, chesed is the first building block. Or the elam chesed yibana, that, that, uh, that uh, what is the second interpretation? It's really not relevant to our discussion here. But the second interpretation is that chesed, that, uh, that once there is a world, we bring chesed into that world. But the first interpretation is that chesed, love, builds this universe. In other words, chesed, love, is the essence that defines existence. And to go to it in the root level, think of it this way. Um, for existence to have come into being from a Torah point of view, God needed to have love. Because why else would he create an existence outside of himself? So it was the love that God wanted to have, a relationship with something that is an independent entity called us, that is the driving force of why we exist. And if you think about it, in the human terms, we in a sense emulate that. Two people who love each other give birth to a child. Why is it 
that the, the birth of a child is a direct result of two people who love each other is because love is the root of relationships. So it's the chesed that we have, the love that we have that gives birth to things. Love, in essence, in essence, we are essentially, as I said, our souls are defined by love. So chesed is not just an act. It's not just a, an outside experience with, outside of ourselves. It's actually the essential part of who we are. It's one of the building blocks, as I said, the number one building block that defines what the soul is made of. So our souls are comprised of, first and foremost, love. So in that sense, um, love is, as I said, is our state of being. Now, if you think of it that way, it really has pretty uh, far-reaching implications. It then means that, um, that each of us, whether we know it or not, is a walking piece of love. Let's put it that way. So when we say, for example, in the beginning of the Torah and the Bible, it says that the human being was created in the divine image. What does it mean, the divine image? So that's a very, a very abstract term that has many different meanings. But what we can say is that we are made of certain, we are essentially divine entities. And what is a divine entity? A divine entity is an entity that is able to love. Uh, an entity that is loving. So if we're all born as, uh, if you were able to define the human being as being a, a lover or a person that loves, and that's how our essence is, then the rest of life is really commentary, actually using Hillel's statement, that the entire Torah is loving another and, and everything else is commentary. The same is true in this sense. We're born as pieces of love, walking a piece of love inside of a body. And then the rest of our life is figuring out how that should be expressed and how, should, how that should be um, experienced. So that really creates, defines in a sense, the essential inner identity of the human being as being one word, love. That is why love is such a resonating experience inside of us because it's not something that is superimposed. It's not like at some point in your life you need love in your life. It's not true. As soon as you're born you need love. I'll go even a step further. When a child is in its mother's womb, for nine months it's submerged in a loving environment. Chava. You don't want to shut that off. Shut it, shut it. <sighs> For nine months, it's submerged in the embryonic fluids, which nurture it, feed it, and so on. So in a sense, before we even enter this world, we are completely submerged in a loving environment. And it's not an accident that water is compared to love, as I said earlier. Love is a, a metaphor for love is, is water. And interestingly, according to the sages, it says that the world too, the universe too, was first completely submerged in water before land and water separated. So think of it like fish in the sea. Fish in the sea are constantly in a nurtured state. They always know, consciously and unconsciously, that they are submerged in the waters of life. We, human beings, have the concept called existential loneliness, where we can feel disconnected. Am I alone in this world? Does anyone care about my problems, my pain? You can walk down the street and feel completely lonely. That type of experience is because there's in the existence, as we know, there's a certain element of disconnection, a certain element of not feeling that we are connected to something greater. Then there are times in our lives where you just feel you fit in, you belong. It could be because of the people that, it could be because of the people that care about you. It could be because of uh, sustaining in nature. It can be you can just put headphones and listen to music and feel like you're submerged underwater. There's something about that imagery of being submerged in water that resonates with us. And you'll, f you'll hear that when any person really falls in love or experiences love or any type of true resonating experience, they'll always describe it as being consumed by something. It's as if you're submerged in something greater than you are. It's a sense of belonging. It's a sense of uh, being cared for. It's a sense of being protected. A sense that someone is... Is, uh, is embracing you. What is an embrace at the end of the day? It's an embrace of somebody who cares about you, hugs you. So they take, they, 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 take, they uh, like, um, completely surround you in an embrace of love. The sukkah that we'll be sitting in is compared to a hug, a cosmic hug. 
uh, the talit that we wear during prayer service surrounds us completely. You'll find in Judaism many different experiences that are all-encompassing. They're meant to be that type of like embrace. And children, when a child falls, when a child cries, what does a parent, a good parent do? You hold the child. You hug the child. You cradle the child. It's all examples of feeling submerged. It's like the fish inside of water. So to give us a head start in life, God made it in a way that nine months, you don't, you don't have to ask for it. No matter what kind of mother you have, functional or dysfunctional, she has no choice. She has to carry a child. I mean, she has a choice what she'll do during that pregnancy, and it could be destructive things too, God forbid. But the child, in most cases, will be protected simply by the by merit of being carried by another human being. And the rest of life is trying to find that type of paradise. It's like trying to discover back to Eden, back to paradise, trying to return to that type of connection. So when we find, when we find kindred spirits and we find people we connect with, that's the feeling. You feel like, you know, sometimes you meet somebody and it's like a long lost friend, a kindred spirit. What are you really feeling? You're feeling connection. There's something about connection that ver is extremely, extremely, um, um, what's the word, warming and nurturing to our lives. And you really can appreciate it by contrast of disconnection, when you feel disconnected. <coughs> when you're around people that don't, that are strange, that people who um, are hostile, you feel disconnected. And we all know that word connection, disconnection. So in that sense, love, and the nurturing that it brings is all about really connection. And going back to the fish and water, what is ultimately the fish and water? Is a fish connected to its source, surrounded by its source. That type of experience is one of the most powerful experiences in, in life. And as such, if you think of it that way, then love is not at all a, a series of techniques and desperate attempts to gain something, to gain some experience. Unfortunately, we look in the world in which we live, you'll see so much emphasis, so much obsession with technique, sexual technique, love technique, here's how you do it, here's how you date, 10 steps, 20 steps, what to do, what not to do. I mean, how many books have been written about this? And every article, people are always reading these articles because it's like you think this is the article that's going to teach me the tricks of the trade. And you read them all, and, the, and let's, let's, let's be honest. Has it made relationships better? I mean, people wouldn't be reading them if it's really working, I guess. Right? So they continue to sell, and they continue to attract us. You know why? Because there's a deep void. And when you don't have the noun, you look for the verb. When you don't have the state of being, you look for the action that's going to make it happen. And this is the world in which we live. This is where marketing and advertising and selling things takes on a complete obscene, grotesque uh, shape. It's trying to sell you something that cannot be bought. It's trying to sell you when every time you look at a magazine, you look at an advertisement, and you, look, you love the images that are being presented, whether it's the clothing, the hairstyles, the car, the, 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 the exotic country. It's trying to sell you intimacy. They're trying to sell you a connection. But it's being sold through a commodity. You know, put, take this perfume, try this, do this, buy this, and you'll nurture and you'll satisfy your inner self. It's in truth, if you think about it, it's actually a contradiction of terms. So when you think of love as something that is your birthright, not only your birthright, that you are a piece of love. A noun, let's call it a noun, not an act. You know, people say, they will make love. They will, uh, that is in a sense, um, even though it doesn't sound, uh, sounds uh, innocent, it's actually a destructive statement because it's essentially turning love instead of something that is within as an act. And if you don't have the act, you don't have the love. That's not true. As I mentioned before, when a parent loves a child, it doesn't, they don't act necessary. It's good, yes, it's healthy that the noun, the state of being, expresses itself in a certain way. I'll address that in a moment. But you love your child 24-7, even when the child is asleep, even when you're asleep, even when the child is at school and you're not seeing the child, even when there's no active interaction. Love is love. It's a state of being. And the truth is, as I said, it's not just, I'm just using it as an example. Each of us is natural love, which is why children by nature just elicit from us hugs and kisses and just uh, that type of affection without any effort. Unless a person is callous. Or, or themselves, uh, they don't love themselves, they will naturally smile to a, to a child. 
and actually it's those that don't smile and those children, children are always aware of those that are, have problems, they, you know there's a real problem. The natural sense is because a child is a piece of love. A soul is love. Not a soul loves, a soul is love. It's a whole different experience. Now some people separate between these two, I've heard this from some psychologists, they say love for a woman is a noun and for a man it's a verb. And they even emphasize it with even the biological, physiological structures that men uh, need an act to make love. And a woman love is something that's eternal, she receives. Now, there may be some truth to it, but the truth is that love is a noun for everybody, including a man or a woman. Everybody has to have an expression of it as well, because you also have the other extreme, where people only say, listen, I love my child, but I never have to express it because I'm always loving that child without expressing. That's also not accurate. In the world that we live in, we do live in a world of action. We do live in a world of expression. So just to say that your, your heart and soul, deep in your unconscious, you love someone, but you never express it, is also not healthy. But the other way around is also wrong. To say that it's only, it's only a sum total of our expressions is not correct. Now this definitely turns over, if you think about it, the whole concept of love. Because it's not like, you know, okay, I'm looking for someone to love. I'm looking for love in my life. That's a, you know, a, a very uh, common statement. I haven't found it yet. I haven't found the love of my life. From a Torah point of view, that's really an accurate statement. The statement, the way it should be stated, to be more, let's put it the, uh, scientifically correct, would, be, would say, love is with you all the time. It's part of who you are. The question is, have you found the person that connects to that love inside of you? And do you connect to the love inside of that person? Sometimes when we call the soulmates, well, what is actually a soulmate? From the Torah point of view, it means that souls, before they came down to this earth, were in a state of love, and each soul has its soulmate. And then they're born into two separate bodies, this one soul. Um, and these two bodies can be in two different countries, foreign to each other, strangers, they may never even know of each other. And then the day comes when they connect, it's not connecting, it's reconnecting. And that's why it's like what's called resonance. Like when you hear music and the music resonates, means you hear something that you always knew was there. Which essentially is saying that the love was always there, it's just that you weren't aware of it. Which in other words is saying that from the youngest age, we are essentially pieces of love, as I mentioned. We're entities called love. Then the outer life takes over, as I described at length earlier. And we begin to be shaped and, by, and identified not by who we are, but by what, what we do and how we perform and our marks in school and then later what we uh, earn and our buying power and our productivity and our looks and all the thousands of other externals that become the, the, our ID. When, when, and what happens as a result, unfortunately, what is obscured and obfuscated is the identity within, the identity that's called love. So now that you've now... Instead of identifying yourself by who you are, you identify by self what you do, so then of course you're going to naturally look for love in an active form of what you do. Because this is how you identify yourself. But if you're able to reconnect to a place where you are who you are, before you became a, uh, an active um, force in life, and this is your job, and these are your relationships, and this is your exp people expect things of you, and this is how people see you, if you're able to connect to that place, the search for love is, takes on a whole different shape. Because you're not looking for some type of external experience, even if it's profound, you're looking for something that is extension of yourself, of the real you. People who love in that way, love everybody and love all the time. You don't find many people like that. You meet people who are really just love human beings. And I mean in a healthy way, you may even saying that today sounds uh, somewhat um, like, a, uh, what's the word for it, uh, sleazy. You know, but the people who just naturally love other human beings, and not in a sexual way, and not in any obscene way, we're talking about just a natural uh, respect, natural, um, uh, uh, a natural respect for the sanctity of another person's soul. There, there are, you rarely find people that have that across the board to everyone at all times. Now let me just qualify, this doesn't mean that you're naive, that person is naive and doesn't understand that some people are, uh, are doing something wrong, some people are criminals. We're talking about 
an experience. We talk about an experience that you, because you have love, because that person is a embodiment of love, therefore love is always gushing and oozing out of them. Now, they have to obviously have discretion, as I said, how to express it and when to express it. There's a statement in the Sefer HaBoyer. You may have heard of this book. It's called the Book of... Boyer means illumination. It's a very much a very... It's a close cousin to the Book of the Zohar, which is Zohar also means illumination. Zohar means splendor. So Sefer HaBoyer is one of the early Kabbalistic works that uh, they written in the time of the Talmud. As a matter of fact, the Sefer HaBoyer has an excellent translation by Arya Kaplan in English. And in this book, there's a statement that says the following. I'll explain it. First, let me make the statement, then I'll explain it. The statement goes like this. That from the time that Abraham was born, Chesed said to God, you no longer need me, because now there's Abraham on earth. That's the expression. So let me explain what this is. I, re I referred earlier, and I'll elaborate a bit more. In the Kabbalistic scheme of things, or let's put it, let's call it like the mystical or the spiritual DNA, building blocks of existence, I mentioned there are seven building blocks. Chesed through Malchus. You know, love, discipline, as I said, compassion, and endurance, humility, bonding, and dignity. Or in Hebrew, Chesed, Gvur, Teferes, Netzach, you say the Malchus. There's also three more intellectual ones, Chachma, Bina, Das, but that's not so relevant to our discussion here. These are Essentially, they are uh, archetypes. There's seven or ten archetypes that when they're in, the, in, uh, with, in the proper configurations will create an uh, the, uh, essential energy that shapes everything in existence. So anything you look at is some form of configuration of these forces. Think of it like the elements or the molecules or the subatom or atoms or subatomic particles. You know, like water is H2O, right? So the, the, the two uh, parts, uh, two elements of hydrogen, one of oxygen is water. Same thing is everything in this universe is some type of combination of Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gur, Teferes, Netzach, Hoyd, Yisrael, and Malchus. As I said in, my Omer, in the Omer book that I wrote, is I do the Chesed, Chesed of Chesed, the Gvur of Chesed, the 49 configurations of Chesed through Malchus. But the configurations multiply many, many times over. So you're looking now, right now at this room, so we see bookcases, floors, tables, chairs, people. Uh, scientists may define this room differently by saying what are the elements that shape this room. And a Kabbalist will tell you what you see in this room is a lot of chesed, gvura, teferis, all in different combinations, some screwed up combinations too. But it's a configuration of inner forces. So just like a doctor takes an x-ray or a CAT scan of the person's body and shows you what makes you tick, the Kabbalistic structure also tells us what makes the universe tick. And in that sense, when someone has that vision and that type of perspective, they can actually see, not necessarily with the physical eyes, but they can talk to someone and get a sense, a diagnosis of where their chesed is like, where their gvur is like, where their teferis is like, where their strengths, where their weaknesses, where you need supplements. Just like a doctor will tell you, you need calcium supplements, you need iron supplements. Here you have too much of certain uh, vitamins or, or, or uh, minerals. So same thing is psychologically and emotionally and spiritually. The, the soul doctor can tell you what areas in your life are maybe over, overabundant, where there's deficiencies, where you need to supplement, where you need to complement, etc., etc. So the perfect human being or the perfect structure is what's called in the Kabbal Kabbalistic terminology is the world of Atzilut. In the world of Atsila, the configuration of the ten spheres is as perfect as it gets. It's like the perfect child. When a child, a healthy child is born, they breathe perfectly. You see the, the chest heaves, the lungs are being used completely. The arteries and the, and, and the capillaries and the veins are all clear. Toxins have not yet entered into the body. So a newborn child is as perfect as it gets. A newborn healthy child. And then the world and life begins to wear us down. So you begin to consume and you begin to inhale toxins. You begin to be affected by the world around you. And then at some point your body is no longer as it was when you were a newborn. The question is how far you can go. Now obviously the body is very resilient. It has ways to, to uh, compensate and it has ways to expand and it can 
can can very can can handle a lot of pressure and 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 um, and, and a lot of uh, deficiency, but then the God forbid there's a point where everybody well any, everybody every human body a point of uh, that uh, a line you shouldn't cross. So the same thing psychologically emotionally there's the quintessential um, perfect archetype of how the ten spheres work. And then there's how those spheres begin to assume distortions as they are shaped by life around us. So every newborn child is born with a perfect capacity to love and to be loved. Where does it get messed up? It gets messed up by the first adults that the child encounters. The parents don't know how to love well, so they begin to basically distort the child's natural loving abilities. This is why it's so tragic. So think of it like, you know, freshly fallen snow, beautiful and white and pure and pristine, and then begin the first people walking on it until it becomes quite dirty, quite polluted. So this is why parenting is such a great responsibility and gift, but also can do so much damage. Because you're taking the perfect archetype and you're actually shaping it. Now things that are not in our control, life, is life will affect everybody. You know, what we breathe and the world in which we live, some things are not in our control. But there are many things that are in our control. Parents control the environment in their home. There's no ifs and buts about it. And they're absolutely responsible. And it's not an excuse to say, my parents screwed it up for me, therefore I have entitled and or I have no control. That's why we're adults, and that's why you have to, uh, uh, we have to um, uh, impose upon ourselves and educate and discipline ourselves. I mean, this is an aside, but I'm just making the point. Because you're dealing here with freshly fallen snow, with a pure um, 